stare at us like we are fools, getting real nervous, talking a lot, getting real fidgety. We need some distraction. Hello everyone and welcome to Autism Stories where we connect you with amazing people that are helping teens and adults with autism become more independent and successful. I'm your host Doug Bletcher, the founder of Autism Personal Coach. I'm a big fan of quotes as I sometimes think they express things that I feel that I'm not articulate enough to say. And Dr. Seuss once said, Today you are you, that is truer than true. There is no one alive who is youer than you. That, I think, is a very appropriate uh, quote regarding today's conversation, in which we will be joined by Barb Rutt uh, and discuss the topic of self-advocacy. Barb has been advocating for adults and children with disabilities for over 25 years. She became a self-taught advocate when she began seeking help when her daughter was two years old and needed school and community services. Barb's career in includes working as a parent mentor for Cleveland Municipal Schools, as a parent training specialist covering Cuyahoga County with the Ohio Coalition for the Education with Children with Disabilities. Currently, Barb is the disability advocate for the Lorain County Safe Harbor Genesis House Domestic Violence Crisis Shelter. Along with her positions, she has volunteered with many organizations within the autism community, as well as being a member of local and statewide task force groups. Barb has experience in helping those who have questions regarding parents, and students' rights in special education, IEPs, 504 plans, evaluations, transition, transition plans, and ISPs. She has conducted trainings in these areas for both parents and professionals, along with the topics of sexuality and domestic violence when it comes to individuals with autism and other disabilities. We hope you enjoy today's conversation. Barb, I have my cup of coffee, so I, yeah. I am good. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for the coffee. Uh, so let's start with how you became involved in the autism community. Oh, well, that is like a loaded question. Back when I ended up being involved in the autism community, actually, I became involved before my daughter was diagnosed. Because I always say at the time, Elizabeth, you know, Elizabeth is about 30 years old, about 30 years ago, High functioning autism wasn't invented. <laughs> That's what I always say. Like. Right. Wasn't invented then. So um, she was always diagnosed with the symptoms. If you think about it, she was nonverbal. Was you know had, uh, diagnosed in the beginning with verbal dyspraxia, um, anxiety, ADHD. Um, she had health issues, GI issues as a young girl. You know, so all of these sensory issues. Oh, that was yeah something that was before we knew what sensory issues were. So it was kind of like all of these issues had come up. So when I became a professional, actually I'm self-taught because when I was always involved as an adult, as a parent, so I was involved in um, our neighborhood association, you know, when I was first married, you know, making, you know, our neighborhood a better place for everybody and, you know, so on and so on. So when I became a parent and Elizabeth was very young and I, she has two older siblings, um, I was always involved, of course, with parent groups. So I, of course, I was, you know, um, part of the preschool PTA. And um, I remember when Elizabeth was a year old, and um, she wasn't speaking, and she's the youngest of three, and 
approaching the doctor with that, and the doctor kept telling me, oh, you're just making a mountain on a molehill. Everybody's talking for her. You got to do this. You got to do that. So I did that. Um, I went home, and um, one of the suggestions he's telling me, if she wants a glass of milk, don't give it to her until she says milk. Okay. Well, then when I did that, she became very angry and behavior, and then that stopped me in my track, and I'm like, as a parent, my gut feeling said, oh, no, this something else is going on. Hmm. Something else is going on. So at year two, same thing. He says, I'm babying her and, you know, all that stuff. So needless to say, you know, that started the journey because um, I was referred to, we had um, a school psychologist from the preschool speak to our group in regards to development. And Elizabeth was happened to be there at the time. She was about maybe two and a half. And I, you know, um, saw her afterwards and she, uh, you know, saw Elizabeth. And then that's when she told me about the preschool. Preschool just started. You know, it was just kind of like preschool programming was just beginning in the school district. So that's how I ended up starting getting involved. So once she went through the testing and we did all that, um, I went to find out as much as I could. Back then, we didn't have the Internet. <laughs> I didn't have a computer at home. So the library was my home. Because I was always ordering books and, you know, trying to research in the library, what is it that's going on with my daughter? Hmm. That's how I did it. I spent many, most of my hours in the, you know, local library. Before, and now, you know, I, I'm thinking, boy, if I had the internet back then, it would be great. So, to go on, you know, she was diagnosed with all these, you know, the symptoms. And then it wasn't until about age of 10 or 12 when she just... Kind of, because I felt like she was on the autism spectrum from what I researched and what my involvement was. I was now, as a parent mentor at P uh, Cleveland Public Schools at the time, so I'm in this field professionally now. And so the more I was learning, the more I'm thinking, hmm, okay, this sounds, you know, about right. So I did finally, um, you know, she had a neuropsych evaluation. And uh, they did diagnose her, though, with PDD-NOS. And at the time, you know, we don't know that as much now because girls on the spectrum look a lot different than boys on the yeah. spectrum. And what happened, um, a lot of the, you know, signs to look for was, you know, related to boys and not to girls. So they were saying, yeah, yeah, she's got autism, but we can't really truly diagnose her because she's too social. Well, mm -hmm. yeah, but she was socially inappropriate. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and as we know, girls are social beings to begin with. Mm -hmm. So it, that's why yeah, I think a lot of girls were, you know, weren't diagnosed with autism. And because, still, yeah. And still, yeah, yeah, because they do look different than what it does. It's just course. gender differences. Exactly. Yeah. And there's gender differences. I mean, you have to look at that first before any diagnosis. Yeah. And then go with it. Yeah. So anyway, and then I ended up, um, and that's how I got involved. So we didn't have a lot of the autism, we didn't have any autism groups <laughs> for me to rely on. Um, so eventually, you know, um, the milestones mm -hmm. ended up, I remember when milestones, you know, it came on, you know, became a group, uh, AS. GC, um, the Autism Society of Greater Cleveland and the Autism Society and Autism Speaks. Oh. All of them, I kind of remember the development of all those and how they came to be and ended up being part of that community. So once in, I believe it was 94, I think it's IDA 94, when um, autism was kind of being recognized on an IEP, um, that's kind of when I started pushing you know, for her to be tested under that um, label. So that's kind of how it all happened. And then it's just kind of snowballed from right. there. And then in doing research um, for, the, for this interview, um, I came across that you worked at the Northeast Action Network. So what were the, your responsibilities there? Okay, well, the Northeast Action Network was actually a task force Okay. that we, I was involved in. And um, I ended up um, as... Uh, parent mentor for the Cleveland uh, uh, Public Schools. I was there for four years. And then after there, I, I then was employed by the Ohio Coalition for the Education of Children with mm. Disabilities. 
And so, and I was the um, countywide advocate for Cuyahoga for them. And I, and I manned the Cleveland office. And so that's, I think back in 2002, 2003, that's when um, Northeast Action Network started forming. And what that was, it was a, a lot of agencies in um, Cuyahoga and school districts got together to form a task force for uh, children's mental health. That's in the schools, how to address it in the schools. It was kind of the forefront of, okay, what are we going to do for these kids? Okay, so it was a task force that we were involved with that, um, you know, there was, a lot, you know, training about mental health and how mental health in children looked different than what it did in adults because at the time they only had the guidelines on how you treat adults, you know, what that treatment looked like. Um, and then how are we going to, you know, um, incorporate this in schools? Mm -hmm. That was part of uh, what the North East Action Network was uh, about. So that, I think that went on for about five years until it disbanded. But um, they were, we were instrumental in, you know, bringing that um, agency like Applewood and uh -huh. um, all those, Belfair and that kind of agencies to come into the school and the home, you know, trying to um, do that piece for the child you know, surround them with services. It's so important. Yeah, and it still is important today, so, you know. Yeah. So, uh, I know you mentioned um, working for the Coalition mm -hmm. for the Education of Children with Disabilities. So, one program that you were involved in that, that particularly piqued my interest was um, called uh, It's My Turn. Yes. Um, so, where you talked with, um, I guess, those 14 and older yes. about transition. So um, I always say that I learned so much from, about autism from adults with autism, Yeah, teens and adults. So what did you learn from those in the program? Oh, wow. You know, the It's My Turn program was one of the favorite things at the coalition that I was trained to do that I was so happy to get to do. Um, the It's My Turn was a two to three day program that we came into the school districts. So at the time, um, only a few of us were able, you know, were um, able, were trained and able to go in and work with the kids. Um, you have, you have to have that patience and, you know, that knack, you know, to be able to go in there for the kids to kind of um, connect to you, trust you in order to learn from you. Yeah. And you had to do it in a, in a quick way because we only had two to three days. So the It's My Turn program, we, I was statewide trainer, so I would go throughout Ohio and, you know, we would travel and uh, schools would want this program. And it was uh, two, uh, how do I say, it was an AM um, session and a PM session. So we did two groups for three days. And what we would do um, is come in and we would do fun things. We would make it interactive. We did, you know, we just didn't stand up and lecture. We, I acted goofy, you know, sometimes if I needed to do that. And um, a lot of times what we did is that we talked about, what are you going to do after graduation? And they go, well, you know, I don't know. People decide that for me. You want somebody to decide that for you. So we would have one of the activities would be what's called the SWAMI. And what the SWAMI would do is that um, I would have a teacher because we would involve the, um, the intervention specialist in with this program because we just kicked it off. They needed to carry it on. And um, we dress them up in a robe and they look like a SWAMI. They would come in and they would call one student at a time up and say, okay, I, uh, what I would do, I would kind of, um, you know, build it up and say, well, the Swami coming in, they're going to tell you. They're going to tell your future. They're going to tell you what you're going to be doing for the rest of your life, right? So you might have somebody who is wanting to work maybe in the area of they love outside and they, you know, maybe they want to do outside work. So right away, the Swami would have these cards, we would have these cards, and she would think, and she goes, okay, this is what you're going to do for the rest of your life. And what it is... It might be a dent it might be a dental assistant. I go, a dental assistant, wow, what a great, you know, what a great job they have. And it tells on there the amount of the salary you uh -huh. may make and the education you need to have uh -huh. and all that. And they're like, uh, I said, how would you like to have 
you know, people, you know, open your mouth and you work in their mouths and, you know, you got to spit going on and then, they, oh no, you know. So the idea was, is that if you want somebody to, you know, decide your future on a um, transition plan, then that's what you're going to get. Mm -hmm. So the importance of how to be a part, to be a self-advocate, to be a part of your own IEP meeting right. and to be a part of that transition and say, no, I don't want this. This is what I want to do. And how, you know, you can work effectively with your school team to um, hopefully have that happen mm -hmm. and plan it out. So we talked about graduation. What supports do you have now on your IEP? Now, will these supports follow you after you graduate? Your intervention specialist going to follow you? No. Is this person? No. Your parents will follow you. You might have um, maybe, you know, if you get support from your uh, religious community, may follow you. But the problem is with this transition, then you've got to think about who is going to be there for you after graduation. Who's your support team? Yes. Because that's what transition is about. Transitioning from one place to another without an interruption of services. And um, in a perfect world, I know that's how it's supposed to go. And that's what, you know, how it's supposed to be. But a lot of times it's not like that. So, right. so by the end, we do budgeting. We do all that kind of stuff. And what they, if they will work on their plan. By the time, you know, the three-day program ended, then they would have a transition plan with the goals completed in um, living skills, you know, their education and um, that kind of stuff and job. So, and then, you know, all it was is that now the teachers, the intervention specialists love it because it was a student-driven transition plan. Mm -hmm. So that's what we did. And then we would have a dinner on the third night and the, the uh, kids would come with their parents and family. We would put it on and they would celebrate and we would talk about what they... Does that, pl does that program currently still exist? I believe it is. I believe it is. So if you um, are in if any school district or anybody is um, wanting more information, you can go to the OCECD website, which is OCECD.org. Or you can give them a call, their number, they have an 800 number, you can call and inquire about the It's My Turn. Why isn't every student in every school district not participating in this program? Because they feel like they do not have a say. They feel like when they, when, and I talk to a lot of the students, um, they feel like when they go to their IEP meeting, especially if behavior is an issue, that um, it's kind of like that, they are the problem. They feel like an IEP meeting to them is like, okay, let's everybody go around the table, point fingers at the student, and let's talk bad about them. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, so if you, I mean, if that was you, would you want to go to your IEP meeting or any? No. 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 So that's why, you know, um, students always say the one thing, if, if I take a message back, is that they do have a voice and they feel like, they need to be respected mm -hmm. as part of the team. Right. Now, during this time period, you were also a visiting lecturer at Notre Dame, mm -hmm. Notre Dame College yeah. um, here in Cleveland for students going into the education field. Mm -hmm. um, so you, you lectured on the necessity and importance of including parents in the process of working together to achieve an actual team approach yes. for the success of the student. Uh, can you talk a little bit about this and what was the students' feedback from this? Was this the first time they had heard that message? Um, you know what? Yeah. And I want to, um, I want to put out kudos to Fran Alrich, Dr. Fran Alrich. She was the um, professor there that brought me in and I, oh my goodness, I think I've done that for 10 years. And um, I lectured both in the undergrad and the grad, you know, students. And there were just educators both in regular education and in special education. And what I did was we talked about parent professional communication. You know, um, what I lectured on is just basic things in communication. Um, I brought in brain research. And some of the brain research is um, saying we would do a little bit of role play. We talked about, you know, when, um, you know, parents come in, how their anxiety is up, mm -hmm. you know, um, how they're nervous. 
um, and all that plays into a part. And I talk about how the brain can shut down. Um, especially when, you know, um, the first thing you do when the parent comes in is start talking negatively about the child. You're going to, boom, shut them down. There's going to be no teamwork. So we talk about that. We talk about how seven positives overturns one negative. <laughs> you know, you know that? Yeah, yeah, sure do. So it's like, if yeah, if you want to talk about, you know, some of the um, things the, the students aren't doing, First of all, you need to begin on how well the student is doing because the teacher will be more, I mean, the parent will be more accepting, you know, of what, of the information that's going on. And I said, as being a parent myself and seeing that was the beauty, not only was I a professional coming in and talking to these people, but I'm also a parent. So who went to IEP meetings for 19 years. <laughs> and I said, as a parent, there, even with me being a professional, when I'm at my daughter's IEP, I'm a parent. I'm a parent. Sometimes I, I have to do that self-talk to make sure that my professionalism, you know, stays intact, but sometimes it doesn't. So you have to realize that, um, for an example, if um, a parent comes to the office and says, I'm here for so-and-so, I you know, IEP meeting or, um, you know, a, a parent meeting or whatever type of meeting it is. And the um, secretary goes, yes, if you just go through this door down the hall and it's just the first door on the right. First of all, it's kind of like the green mile. <laughs> you're walking down, you feel like you're going to your execution and that you're nervous and nobody's there. And then once you walk into that room, I said, you see everybody sitting around the table and they go, oh, and there's that chair for you. And guess what? That's the hot seat. Mm -hmm. That's how parents view it. it mm -hmm. This is, might not be what you set it up to be, but that's how, you know, the parent feels. Mm -hmm. So one of the things to read, and then if the parent sits there, they're going to feel like they're on trial. Because, again, they feel like they're responsible and sometimes they're made to feel responsible if their child is not uh, progressing as well as they should be, whether it's through academics or behavior, they they come out of that um, meeting feeling like it's their fault. Right. Okay, so I said a simple, just a simple thing you can do to reduce that a parent's anxiety is that when the parent does show up, intervention specialist, teacher, whoever you're the head of the team, come out and meet them. Hi, Mrs. Smith, how you doing? I hope you were able to find a place to find that little, they call it um, chit-chat. Mm -hmm. That chit-chat kind of helps reduce that anxiety and helps them to breathe saying, okay, this might not be such, maybe this won't be so bad. You know, oh, I'm glad you, you were able to make it, you know, so why don't you come with me and we'll go to the meeting. So instead of them going down this long hallway, they feel like by themselves that, you know, now they feel like they have support. Mm -hmm. And then when they walk in the room and they see all these people just say, well, Mrs. Smith, let me introduce you to the team. And here, you know, there's a couple of seats. Where would you like to sit? Give them a choice. Those are just small little things we can do to reduce that anxiety in parents, you know, in order for a, to have an effective meeting. Because when our anxiety, when we get so emotional, our body kicks into that fight, flight, or freeze moment. And so, and when the parents are in that moment, you're not going to get anything accomplished at a meeting. And I tell them, I don't know about you, but um, I don't want to be going to three, four, five meetings because I can't get anything accomplished. So if you, you know, try to do little things in the beginning, you're going to, you're going to be more effective. Well, what about prior to the meeting in terms of pre-planning to make things? I, yes, prior to the meeting, I always tell the teacher, instead of having this parent meeting you for the first time at this yeah. meeting, it's good to either call them in or call them on the phone. Call them on the phone and say, hey, Mrs. Smith, I'm just letting you know that, you know, we are planning for this first IEP and, you know, or the psychologist, whoever it is. You know, we're planning for this first meeting. Um, I know you're, you are familiar with some of the issues because of some of the notes and all that that come home. I just want to get from you, what is it that you would like to address? Get them involved because I tell, I tell them, you know, parents have a right to be a part of that meeting and they're just as an equal participant than um, professionals. 
And then one of the things I as professionals, when IDA say that parents are equal participants in their child's decision-making team, what does um, equal participation mean to you? Does that mean to you that you guys already saw the information and IEP and everything and, and then all of a sudden the parent is uh, getting it right there and then there? How is that equal participation when you guys have worked on it for two weeks and already discussed it back and forth and know what that IEP is going to say and that parent has no idea what that um, IEP is saying and that um, how can they be an informed participant if they don't have that information up front? So we talk a lot about it. So many clients of Autism Personal Coach um, deal with some type of abuse in, in their lives, um, whether it's verbal, physical, or domestic abuse. Mm -hmm. So which brings me to um, one of your current positions with your work at the Genesis House. Um, do you think that people with disabilities are more likely to incur this abuse, and what can be done to re reduce the frequency of this in the future? Well, you know what, I, I would love, <laughs> I could talk many hours on this, let me tell you something. Um, one of the things that I want to um, say is that um, people with disabilities, and it says here, according to researchers, disability can act to increase vulnerability to abuse, often indirectly, as a function of society's response to disability rather than the disability itself being the cause of the abuse. So what happens is that, um, you know, individuals with disabilities, um, the last, I'm trying to um, see here, the, um, the last that I see here, let's see, the, the victim survey says people with intellectual disabilities, which that includes um, the autism spectrum, experience more violence in general when compared to those without disabilities. In 2008, the National Crime Victim Survey found that people with disabilities experience higher rates of violence than people without disabilities. At least 40 victimizations per 1,000 persons with disability compared to about 20 per 1,000 without disabilities. So they are at higher risk of being abused than typical people. And that's a concern. And one of the things that I do at Genesis House, I am the disabilities advocate. And just explain real quickly, Genesis House is um, a domestic violence crisis shelter. Uh, we provide not just the shelter, but we also provide education out into the whole county of Lorain County. So um, we're, we're in schools, we have support groups, we, uh, we're in the courts, we're, we're everywhere when it comes to abuse. Now, part of my job is I do support groups. I do educational groups and I do support groups with individuals with disabilities. And they're across, that include autism, and they're across, you know, uh, the disability range. Um, I have anybody between the ages of 18 to 70 in my group that have been victims of abuse, whether financial abuse, sexual abuse, which is the highest, um, physical abuse from an intimate partner or from a caregiver abuse or um, a family member. Um, so, you know, those are types of abuse that go on uh, with this, um, with, you know, people with disabilities. My opinion is a lack of social skills that are in the schools. Um, for an example, just because um, one person feels like they have a lot of friends don't mean that they have the social skills to know the ins and outs of different types of relationships. And um, when it comes to um, dating violence among our teens, it, it, it is growing. It is very high. That's why in the state of Ohio, all school districts and schools must um, have um, a dating violence slash harassment stalking plan within their school and to, in order to teach our, you know, our students, you know, the difference between a healthy relationship and an unhealthy unhealthy relationship. Nine times out of ten, um, adults think, 
you know, especially in the school, that, oh, this person has a disability. We're not going to, to bring them into the classroom because, you know what, they probably will never be involved in a relationship, so we're not going to, to go there. Wrong. Wrong. They... They are people that grow up in an adult body, no matter what their cognitive function are. Um, they want and have a relationship just like any other person. So do you feel like people with disabilities are getting less education on sexuality and, and, and those relationships? Exactly. Exactly. And you know what? And sometimes parents are scared of that, too, especially mm -hmm. for their child with disabilities. You know, um, I, and coming as a parent... I have to say, especially a daughter, I know, and, and not that, and girls do get victimized more than boys, even though the male, the boys are on the rise and because it, it doesn't make any difference. She needed it more than anybody else. When she was in school and they started doing that talk, I tried to get her into a lot of these classes. Now, remember... I always was telling them, oh, and they go, oh, well, well, fine, then we'll just put her in the class. No, we're not just going to put her in the class so she can sit in the back and do whatever she wants to while you guys have your um, lesson. All right, if we're going to do this and do this right, she will be a part of the class. We're looking at, okay, what's the curriculum? Can she access that curriculum? And if not, how are we going to modify or accommodate her so she'll be able to you know, participate at, as fully as she can. I'm not just going to stick her in the room just so you say, okay, all right, we've got her in here. We'll just mark her down. She's part of the, no. How is she accessing that education? And that's the whole key. I also do a training that's called Journey to Adulthood, you know, that I've done through the PACER, which is in Colorado. And they have a fantastic program called, you know, it's called Journey to Adulthood. And I, I presented it many times at the uh, Milestone Conference and um, different um, conferences around. It talks about, you know, how to talk to your child, how to, and that should be an ongoing conversation, no matter if they're verbal or nonverbal. Because the one thing we got to teach them is once they become an adult, no matter where they're cognitively at, they're going to have feelings as any adult, a normal adult. Yeah. So if we don't teach them, they may act out inappropriately. And, that what, and sometimes that happens and they get a part of the legal system mm -hmm. because maybe now they did something that um, was innocent to them, but yet, you know, was against the law. Mm -hmm. And I... With our clients, I'd say that, you know, our average client has probably verbal abilities of at least the average mm -hmm. American. But I think what, what they struggle with is to, one, connect with their feelings, and then, two, to communicate about their feelings. So in, in cases like that, um, when looking at this type of abuse, like what would be some signs or that you... That, that, people can look at to, to just kind of ask them those questions. Exactly. Well, I always used to advocate that when, if a ch child can be totally verbal and they can be intelligent when they talk, but that doesn't mean that they are understanding the social communication aspect of language. That's mm -hmm. where that pragmatic piece is so important because somebody can be very, very smart and talk intelligibly, but yet when you're talking about the nuances, the slang, and um, that kind of stuff, when it comes to uh, sexuality, you know, that's, that's a different um, piece. Um, looking at behavior changes, that's the main thing, behavior changes. Um, is that child, even though they're verbal and sometimes they're older, um, are they reverting back? And that could be, um, you know, aggressive behavior. Is it maybe um, that maybe they're having accidents at night? Okay. Or maybe, you know, potting issues become an issue again. So we have to look at all of this, you know, um, if, because parents are so, so in tune with their child. If we know, and I know with my daughter, I will know one thing that's off with her. What's going on with her? Maybe it's a bad day, I get it, but yeah. maybe not. Yeah. 
but especially let's try you know like uh, menstrual periods with girls okay a lot of time goes oh my gosh we'll just put her on the pill so she will never get her period yeah you could do that but that's not going to um, solve the issue um, when my daughter started her menstrual period, I recognized the sign that she will be, and I was upfront with it in the beginning. This is what's going to happen. Now, trial and error with her and I, um, when she did start, she understood what it was, but what happened, we had that anxiety because she wasn't sure when it was going to come every month, mm -hmm. and then, of course, it would come, and she'd be at school, or she'd be on a field trip, and I'm forever taking clothes and stuff with, I mean, it was, so finally, we made the, the decision after researching it that put her on birth control. I We put her on birth control this way, her periods come Every 28 days, she could track them on a calendar. She knew what to expect. She knew a couple of days before she would be prepared herself. We would talk about prepare, take stuff with you mm -hmm. in your book bag. You know, and, and, and that would create a lot less anxiety. Because she knew what to expect. Yes. And it made her more comfortable when it did come with her. Uh, and then especially when we talked about cramps and headaches. And, and, and she is actually more in tune with her body than... I probably was ever was. <laughs> she does. So, I mean, so even like to this day, she will say, oh, okay, this is happening. She can feel that. And, and, and it's, it's like this gift. I don't know what she has. She, they, they, they just do know. Oh, that time's coming. And mm. she knows. She, she She's hypersensitive does. to it. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. So, but, um, but you don't want your child learning from somebody else. Or from getting wrong information from TV, media, or anything else. Because that's where they revert to. And if you want them to be a healthy adult and to, um, to be able to handle puberty and, you know, um, sexuality, you know, in the right way, then we need to have mm. to get out of our, we have to get out of our comfort mm -hmm. zone as parents. And um, have to be able to teach them. If all of what you do isn't enough, I recently <laughs> found out that uh, you are the victim services representative for the Pathways to Justice program. Yes. So for those that don't know about that program, what can you tell us about this? Well, what the program is about. And um, I just want to let you know that, you know, in Northeast Ohio, we're on hold right now. Because uh, we're trying to find a new leader. But the Pathways to Justice program, this was something that um, was, I was approached with this back in the beginning of the year. Uh, and it was through um, the, um, the Northeast Cleveland office of the ARC. And um, Pathways to Justice, you can find this and um, you can Google that or, you know, your search engine. And it's through the National ARC, A-R-C. And uh, what they do is they go around the country and they um, train uh, not only just police officers, but attorneys, prosecutors, judges, victim advocates, um, those people that are part of the criminal justice system in order and how to approach um, those on the autism spectrum and with um, IDD you know, individuals are developmentally disabled or, um, you know, or if they're a victim of a crime, because a lot of times um, those with uh, individuals with disabilities who become a victim of crime, whether it's sexual abuse, the financial abuse, whatever, they are not believed. Or they say, oh, they have a disability. It's either their word against the other person or right. what have you. So, and, and a lot of times, uh, with because of sensory issues, communication issues, not the language, not that they don't know how to talk. It's the, commu how the communication um, behavior. Because when a crisis like that happens and trauma happens to a typical person, it we're learning a lot about how trauma affects the brain. Mm -hmm. So, but, and if it affects, and in in, if the trauma affects the brain in a typical person that much, where now they're saying you don't question people right away because of, you know, they have to work through it and you wait and 
all those other. Just think of an individual with a disability because the brain does work a little bit different. And then if you add that trauma piece to it, if you have uh, somebody who, you know, has issues when it comes to memorizations or something like that, or uh, communication, it's going to affect them even more. So we have to put that out there, especially if, or an individual maybe um, was falsely accused of something and was arrested and they questioned them and they question them hour upon hour and hours. And what happens is that, um, you know, and I'm, and I'm not here to bash anybody and I don't want, uh, we, we, the, we have great police, we have great people in the courts, but sometimes because they're so quick in trying to close a case because they have so many that you know they may tell the person well if you if you just sign this right this confession right now even though they didn't do it you can you can go home and then they send and you can go home and you can go you can be with your mom or you can be with your dad or whoever and so they'll sign it not knowing that they're signing a confession that they committed a crime and then when they don't go home right away, then, the, you know, all of a sudden the aggressive behavior comes up and, you know, then it becomes a mountain over molehill. So we try to, and, and there's um, probably a lot of people in our prison system that are, have been kind of falsely accused. And we have stories on the Pathways to Justice um, website on individuals with disabilities who were accused, actually went to death row, and actually were ex executed, then found out afterwards these people were innocent wow. because they didn't, you know, they just didn't approach them and they didn't give them the accommodations or whatever they Kind needed. of a rush through to justice. Yeah, because um, a lot of times our individuals with disabilities, the adults, and I hate to say trained because I hate the word trained, taught, they're taught from the time they've been to school, that you have to comply with adult rules. Right. You know, I get that, I understand that, but I don't. I remember having a discussion with my daughter's school. Now, again, I, I can go through brain research and that will take a couple hours because I love to talk about brain research. And um, what, what happens in individuals with disability, the brain develops at a slower pace than it does a typical person. So my daughter was 18 and she was just entering puberty at 14. You know, the brain was like at about a 14 years old. And what happens with when you have um, a teenager going through puberty? They don't want to listen to adults. They know everything. You know, <laughs> they're defiant. I mean, we can we can make a list, right? Right. Well, guess what? Now I had an 18 year old who knew she was an adult at an adolescent with an adolescent brain. Bad combo. <laughs> Driving me nuts, and I'm sure she dropped the school nuts. So um, when I ended up with an IEP, and I dropped IEP, because I always get a draft IEP 10 school days before the meeting, <laughs> or any plan, no matter if you're in college or whatever, the plan said um, the first goal under behavior was she will listen to all adult directive. I said, absolutely not. Oh, they, they looked at me, they go, what? I go, no, this is not going to be on there. Well, you know, I said, I feel for you. I have the same thing going on at home. She doesn't want to listen to me. But you know what? I am not going to have you, uh, um, well, how do I want to say, um, teach her skills so she is compliant. Because when she becomes an adult and gets a job, I don't want her lifting her skirt to make a front, saying, well, in order for you to get do, if you want to, um, you know, eat your lunch, or if you want to do this, you need to do this for me. No. Mm -hmm. I said, what to the- To comply to another adult. Exactly. Because she feels like, even though she's an adult, other adults have say so over her. You don't know. Mm -hmm. She is an adult. She's an American citizen. She, her, she, she has a right to her opinion. She has a right to whatever. Right now, yeah, it's kind of a little difficult because of where her brain is. 
But what we can do is that she can learn the skills and how to appropriately um, say no when she doesn't agree with you. When to appropriately, you know, um, work with you when you're trying to give her a directive. That's mm -hmm. what she needs to learn. Right. She is not going to become like, you know, unfortunately how we train animals, like, okay, sit, oh, good dog, here you go. No, we're not doing that. She, she needs to grow up as an individual and her own advocate, and that's how we're going to do this. And it's, I think it's important to teach people that it's okay to say no. It is. Yeah. It, and it's okay to be angry. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, why is it that us adults, we get mad at uh, the, the student or we get mad at the children or whatever, but when they get mad, ang angry at us right away, oh, they have a behavior problem. You know, no, they're allowed to have the feelings they're allowed to feel. They just need the skills on how to do it appropriately. And what, what advice would you give to adults um, with autism and learning to advocate for themselves? Oh, knowledge is power. Knowledge is power. You're going to make mistakes and that's okay. Mm. You know, everybody makes mistakes. Nobody's perfect. I think um, we're so used when we're growing up in the system as a person with a disability that we feel like we have to be perfect all the time because we're either told or we're led to believe that we need to do that in order to be good. No, that's okay. But you know what? You are allowed to have your opinion. You are allowed to have, you know, if something in your gut tells you this is not right, please question it. You can question it. Say, I don't agree with you. I'm sorry. You know, but we have to learn to do things appropriately. And a lot of times it comes with trial and error and it comes with a lot of practice and it comes with a lot of, you know, um, having a mentor and um, having that always have a safe person. Who is your safe person? You know, is it your mom? Is it your dad? Is it maybe an autism personal coach? Yeah. You know, is it somebody that um, you relate to? It could be a big brother, a little brother, big sister, little sister, whoever it is identify that safe person and if you are not agreeing or if you feel like you're being railroaded or whatever talk to your safe person help them let them help you work with you through that and help you through that so you can better advocate for yourself and if you feel the need to always ask for that support person to be at any meeting any meaning. It's not that you don't know what's going on or you can't learn because a lot of times you go, oh no, I'm an adult. I can do it now. Even myself, when I'm at a meeting for a doctor's or something, if it's something important, I have somebody there with me because we only hear 50% of what's being presented and only remember half of that. So when we walk away with any meeting, whether it's a doctor's no matter a school, classroom or whatever, we're only walking away with a fourth of the information that's been presented. Mm -hmm. So it's always good to have a second set of ears or record. So because how many times have I watched the same program over and over? Go, oh, I didn't remember that. Right. Oh, come. You catch something the second, the third time, mm -hmm. yeah, that you didn't do those other times. Yeah. So just give yourself that luxury. You, it's okay not to be perfect. It's okay. You know, just say, I can't give you an answer now, but I'll get back with you. Thanks, Barb. You're welcome. <laughs> thank you, everyone, for listening today. And Barb, thank you so much for the conversation. I thought a really important theme of the conversation is that your voice matters and that your voice should be heard. And so often teens and adults with autism struggle with this and as a result don't have success in their lives. Autism Personal Coach is a unique service in that we help those with autism by working on meaningful, individualized goals in the setting in which they will be used so their anxiety is greatly reduced and as a result they become more independent and successful. One of those important goals that we help our clients with is to be better self-advocates and for their voices to be heard. So to get an autism coach for a loved one or yourself to help you support you with this, it's very easy. All you have to do is email autismpersonalcoach at yahoo.com or call 216-336-5889 and request a coach today. On next week's episode of Autism Stories, we will have a great conversation with Lamar Hardwick 
a self-advocate who is a pastor, husband, and father. Talk to you then.